Well, good morning. Good to see you in Sunday school this morning. Thank the Lord for a beautiful Sabbath day. We're thankful for the Lord's day this morning, trusting him to help us in a special way today. Amen. We should be able to have a a lesson leaflet. Young gentlemen are passing them out. We're going to talk to you about the doctrine of preservation. Sounds like a theology study for seminary students, doesn't it? But it's vitally important that laymen begin to understand that it's very important which Bible you use. And I've got a lot of information for you this morning. Uh, We won't be able to cover it all probably in the time frame. But inside your lesson leaflet is a pamphlet that talks about the most predominant Greek text that's used to translate Bibles. And it talks about the most common Greek manuscript that's used to teach preacher boys Greek. And it is, it is enlightening to read who wrote that Greek New Testament. So I encourage you to read the tract, record some pertinent information in the back of your Bible so that you can talk about it, and then pass the tract along to your pastor or if you're in Bible school, maybe your college professor. But we're trusting the Lord to help us this morning. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we certainly thank you this morning for the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, for your love and grace today. We ask your help in the study this morning. We pray that you would just come and minister to us as only you can, and we'll praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Most all of us have heard, you may not have heard it called the doctrine of inspiration, but uh, doctrine simply means teaching. People get scared of doctrines. Doctrine scares people away, but the word doctrine simply means teaching. So the teaching of the Bible on inspiration, inspiration as it relates to the Holy Scriptures is that we believe that God, inspired those holy men of old to write what they wrote. So it wasn't really their words. It was God's words. And how important that doctrine is that we believe in divine inspiration, that God spoke these words through human instruments. Over 40 men help write the the Bible as we have it. It spans 15 centuries, 1,500 years between some of these books. And so that's huge. But then when you find such a collection of writings that are so cohesive, so uniform, and so uh, united in thought and purpose, it's an amazing book. Amen. It is a truly amazing book, but it's amazing because God wrote it. This is not man's doing. This is God's word. And the, the doctrine of inspiration simply states that God moved upon these individuals and they wrote as they were moved. And the scripture plainly says this. They wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't their words that are recorded. So the doctrine of inspiration, most all of us and most Bible schools that are anywhere near fundamental still believe in the doctrine of inspiration. But those original letters called manuscripts, some of them have long been gone. And what we have today are copies of the original. Okay? We have some down here, fellas, that don't have a a lesson. If one of you bring... uh, these folks are less than these. And, uh, boy, don't take me long to jump track and forget where I was at. <laughs> Copies. Thank you. Thank you. The manuscripts that we have are copies of copies. Okay. The, the, the Bible that we have today has been handed down to us through various copies of copies. And these, these copies is where the 
question comes in, especially in our modern critical age, that, you know, how do we know that these copies are still the Word of God? So that's where the doctrine of preservation comes in. If God could inspire holy men of old to write his word, could he not overshadow holy men as they translated and copied his word? We believe he could do that. I mean, God can do anything, right? Well, if he could do that, why wouldn't he? Think about it. And we're going to look at some scriptures here very shortly that tell us very plainly that he did that. But even in some of our conservative Bible colleges this morning, they do not believe that we have the Word of God in our current edition. And I can prove that. Some of their publications. One doctor in one of our better-known Bible schools in their periodical that they send out to everybody, so I'm not talking out of school. He said when he runs into a passage that's not consistent with certain manuscripts, he just kind of lays that passage aside. Really? You mean we can take part of our Bible that we don't know where it came from, but we just lay it aside? Friends, we have the Word of God. We have God's word preserved for us. Let's look at some scripture. 1 Peter 1.23, it's in your outline there. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. He didn't say that someone else's word would abide forever, but he said that his word would abide forever. 1 Peter 1, 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by the gospel which is preached unto you. Peter believed that the Bible that he had had been preserved. He believed in the doctrine of preservation. What he was preaching was the word of God. When Jesus quoted New Te- Old Testament scriptures, he was referring to them as scripture. Look in Luke down there. Jump down to Luke. 4, 18 through 21. This is the text he took out of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say, Unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus validated the preservation of the Old Testament, okay? And if God could take it all the way back to Moses' day, up to Christ's day, and preserve his writings, and and there is so much to, when you study into this, the the Masorites, they, they recorded The Old Testament scriptures were copied with such meticulous detail and accuracy that they, uh, when they copied a a book or a chapter, when the scribe would copy it, they knew how many Hebrew letters were in that chapter or book. And when that scribe turned his work over to the master scribe, that's all I know what to call him, that man would count every letter in his transcript If he didn't have the exact number of Hebrew letters that were supposed to be in that book, it was all thrown out. I mean, that's accuracy. That's pinpoint accuracy. So the Word of God has been preserved for us. Matthew 24, 35, Mark 13, 31, and Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Aren't you glad? I mean, I'm getting a little hopeful here that we might have the Word of God. Amen. Isaiah 48, the grass withereth. 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou, listen, 
shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I say hallelujah. I say thank the Lord. When they tell me that I don't have a Bible or they tell me that my Bible has mistakes and errors in it, they, they, they're going to have to find somebody else. They're going to have to talk to somebody else. I, I've been here. They got to me too late. I believe we have the Bible this morning. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to a few generations. That's not what it says. You, you catch on to me pretty quick. To all generations. Does that include 2022? My generation and yours? Has God then preserved his word for us? I believe he has. Psalm 119.52 says, Concerning thy testimony, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Psalm 119.160, The word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Now that's a sampling of scriptures that plainly tell us that God's word is here to stay. Not one jot, Jesus said, or one tittle shall pass away until every word of it is fulfilled. Good news. Good news. I heard the story of a, of, a, of a lady that was on her deathbed, and her pastor came in to see her, and uh, she said, Pastor, would you read something from my Bible? And there was a Bible laying there. He picked it up, and he, he began to flip through it, and he began to notice it. Man, there's page after page been torn out of this Bible. And he looked at her and he said, why are all these pages missing? Well, she said, Pastor, when you preached and you said that it didn't mean that, I just tore it out. Friend, if any part of this book is inerrant, we have no confidence that any of it is true. If you can prove to me that any part of this is an error, I can have no faith in the rest of it. But we know that God has preserved his word. God doesn't lie. God tells the truth. He's faithful to do what he promises to do. And he has preserved his word for the English-speaking people. We're blessed. We have a tried and true version. It's over 400 years old. It stood the test of time. It's brought many a saint into the kingdom. It's helped many a sinner to find their way to Calvary. Friend, this old King James Bible is, a, is, the, is the version, in my opinion, and I believe I would have a lot of support here, that it is the version that God has put his hand on to give the English-speaking people the word of God. So we believe that the scriptures were inerrant in their original state, you know, when you, you look into your church bylaws and in, in your church statement of faith, it's amazing how many churches say, we believe the word of God to be inerrant as it was originally given. Well, what about now? What about now? I wasn't there when it was originally given. Did you hear Moses? Anybody here? <laughs> no, you didn't. I didn't hear Elijah or Isaiah or Jeremiah or even Jesus. I wasn't there to hear what they said. I am totally relying on the Word of God being preserved, intact, inerrant, complete, as God overshadows the process of translating and transcribing from one document to another. I fully believe that God has kept us with a Bible, and we are a blessed people. On your English Bible, someone said there's about 150 versions of English-speaking Bibles, translations, or versions. As I did my research, I found that there was probably 50 in our day that is still in use or still in any measure used, about 50 versions. That narrows it down quite a bit. From 150 to 50, we're doing better. But then you begin to try to narrow down from those 50 to one Bible that you believe to be the Word of God. And so, it's real easy. It's real easy. 
There are two sources for our English-speaking Bible. One of them we call the Antiochian text, coming from the city of Antioch where Paul and Silas and Barnabas and the early church had created a hub of Christianity and Christian activity. And then there's the Alexandrian text which comes out of Egypt, of all places. And these two streams provide the, the material for almost every English Bible being printed. The vast majority of translations have come in the last 150 years, or in the late 1800s. This began to be a big thing, new translations. And it's really accelerated in the 1900s. And uh, we have a Bible for women. We have a Bible for the Afro-American people. We have a Bible for everybody. And that Bible is created to say what each individual group wants to hear. But I don't really want the Bible to tell me what I want to hear. I want the Bible to tell me what God wants me to hear. If you really want to go to heaven, you want a book and a Bible that tells you what God says. But these two streams, the Textus Receptus, which is the Antiochian text, the Received text, any of those terms, refer to the Greek manuscripts that uh, our King James Bible was translated from. All the others, and I, I, I put the caveat, there could be one. The New King James claims to come from the Textus Receptus, but there's so many changes in it, it would be hard to tell. But all of the new modern translations use the corrupted Alexandrian text, the corrupted Greek text, the Nestle Alain Greek text. And that talks about that in this little pamphlet. It tells you about some of the authors. It tells you about some of the people. But I want you to know from, from the, the uh, vast amount of archaeology that's been done in Israel and with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we now know we have 5,309 surviving pieces of Greek manuscripts and that contain all or part of the New Testament. Ninety-five percent of these three thousand or five thousand three hundred texts agree with the Texas Recept. Scholarship is on our side. Study is on our side. Archaeology is on our side. These Greek manuscripts that have been found, some of them complete books, they agree with the Textus Receptus 95% of the time. That's, that is an overwhelming majority. Uh, the King James Bible stands alone uh, as far as coming purely from the Textus Receptus, and therefore you have a pure fountain which can produce a pure stream. You have a corrupt fountain in the Alexandrian Egypt text which will produce a corrupt stream. You don't get salt water or you don't get pure water out of a salty uh, fountainhead. You don't get uh, you know, clean water out of a polluted uh, well or pool. And so that's true in, in Bible uh, translation. So the problem is not choosing between dozens of English Bibles. You choose the Bible that's got the best source. And that is undeniably the King James Bible. Uh, you can read some of that there. I'm not going to read all of that. But the Nestle Land Greek Testament is the standard New Testament used in many of our Bible colleges and seminaries. Uh, they say it's the closest thing we have to the original. But this is a case where older is not necessarily better. If the oldest manuscripts that they have in Egypt were corrupt, and we have manuscripts from Antioch that might be a hundred years newer, but they're pure. Age really is not the most important factor. So when they say that, they, they're, they're telling you the scholars, you know, they have all these uh, 
reasons why that they promote this, but this Nestle Alan tag that is supposed to be the Bible in its earliest manuscripts, but evidently there's problems with it. I mean, we know there's problems with it, but even they know there's problems with it because it's been revised 28 times. The Greek text that many of your new modern English Bibles are coming from has been revised by these people 28 times. Think of it. So either God didn't say what he meant to say and they needed to figure that out, we got preachers and people doing that today. God didn't mean what he said. I am a firm believer that God says what he means and means what he says. And it's not to be tampered with. It's not to be changed. It's not to be updated. In my early zeal uh, as a new Christian, and I read the, the Bible through many times and spent hours and hours in the Scripture as a newborn Christian, and I'd read that in the book of Revelations where that, that curse, if you want to call it that, or promise, if any man taketh away or addeth to the words of the prophecy of this book, his name be taken out of the book of life. You remember that? It's in, the, it's in the book of Revelation. Well, then they come out, this is probably late 70s, uh, they come out with the Reader's Digest Condensed Bible. I thought, man, if you condense something, you're bound to take something out. And that troubled me. As a new Christian, I wrote Reader's Digest a letter. It wasn't real, well received. Because I quoted that book, that scripture out of Revelation, and I warned them. I wrote them a, a warning letter saying, hey, you folks are in danger of hell, fire, and judgment, taking part of God's word out. Well, they didn't, they didn't heed as far as I know, and they wrote me a pretty nasty letter in response. But uh, in my zeal, I... I still did what I thought I should do. I reminded them of what God said. But the, in uh, one of the writers of this Nestle, Alain, Greek New Testament, there's some pretty shady characters if you read the track. One of them said that he didn't believe that Paul wrote First and Second Timothy. Did he ever read First and Second Timothy? Paul was talking to his son in the faith. I mean, there's nobody else could have wrote First and Second Timothy but Paul. But he didn't believe that. And he didn't believe Paul wrote Titus. He called the book of Job ancient folklore. Didn't Jesus refer to Job? I believe he did. He called Jonah a popular legend. Elijah and Elisha were just legendary elements. <laughs> they didn't exist. They were just legends. Paul Bunyan and, you know, all these legends that we have. Um, but Elijah is said to be a man of like passions, such as we are. He was a man, a real man, a prophet of God. God used him mightily, but would you want someone giving you a Bible that didn't believe that the Bible that they had was true? Or the people that were named in that Bible were real? Would you want to read a Bible after a person like that? Then you better shy away from these other versions, my friend. Because that's exactly the, the text. And they wrote the fountainhead. They put the Greek text together that every English-speaking Bible, except the King James, is taken from. So I encourage you to know that and to be aware of that. Do we want to trust our souls to men that have no faith in the Word of God? There's two men by the name of Westcott and Hort. They were, they were, what did I say, uh, really uh, used of the devil to corrupt the Greek text. They were heretics. They didn't believe. One of them had mostly Catholic belief. He, was, he believed the Virgin Mary was, uh, you know, that it'd be all right to pray to her, all right to set up these little statutes and pray to them. And I, I, I'm 
when you go back and study the authors of some of these Greek manuscripts, you realize that they had no interest in preserving the Word of God. They had every interest in, in, you know, in my opinion, you know, down through the centuries, the devil has tried to stamp out the Bible in many ways. Burning the Bible was a big thing uh, in the Dark Ages and even into modern times, the Chinese, the Russians, all these uh, atheist uh, dictatorships, they, they try to get rid of the Bible because Christians are a problem. We're true to one God. We're true to one Savior. And we don't vow absolute allegiance to the dictator. Just like the Hebrew boys wouldn't bow. We can't do that. And therefore we become a problem to people who demand absolute control of your lives. But uh, when you think about, you think about the, the type of people that put together some of these manuscripts, it is really, really scary. I want to talk to you a little bit about the New King James. I'm going to try to limit this to 45 minutes this morning so you'll have a few minutes to stretch your legs before the memorial service. The New King James comes along, and they said, we're just going to take out those old, archaic English words. And I've heard people say, the King James is just too hard to understand. Now, I don't know about you, but when I took welding, my first year of welding, the first thing they did was not strike an arc, put an electrode and a, and a, a welding cable in my hand. The first thing we did is we went to class. I had to learn the language of welding. I had to know what an electrode was. I had to know what an arc gap was. I had to know what flux on the electrode did. I had to know something about welding. I had to learn the language. I had to know what a fillet well was. I had to know a number of things about welding before I could ever go back there in the shop and begin to start welding. You know, if we Christians would take this as a matter of, uh, of course and say, hey, it's worth my time to study some things, it really don't take long to learn what thee means. <laughs> or thou, or thine, or thy, thy kingdom come, your kingdom. I mean, is that really that time? Or is it a cop out? The old English is very helpful in some areas. All the words that end with or that start with T that I just mentioned, they are singular. You can tell whether they're talking to one person or about one person. And the ye, which would be our you, and in the English language, you can be the, either singular or plural. You have to determine that by the context. Or guess at it. You, we don't know if it's plural or not. But ye is plural. So when Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again, he wasn't just referring to Nicodemus. Ye, plural. A little helpful there, I think. A little, little clarification. Gives me a little better understanding of the scripture. Uh, when you get the words that have ETH on them, very helpful, very helpful this morning. ETH designates a tense of the verb. Now, I'm no grammarian. You come from West Virginia, grammar didn't matter, okay? But I have tried through the years to learn a little bit, especially when it comes to my Bible. And what I found out about ETH is the tense is present tense ongoing. He that believeth on him shall have everlasting life. Is it a one-time thing and it's done? He that believes, he didn't say believes or believe. He that believeth on the Son of God hath eternal life. ETH means you don't only believe it today, 
but you're going to believe it tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and you're going to keep on believing. This is really important when you get down to some scriptures and some doctrines, and I picked a, a controversial one for illustration in my outline. Let's look at it. Luke 16, 18. Whosoever putteth, puts and keeps putting, away his wife, and marrieth another, commit, committed, no, not present tense, not past tense, present tense, ongoing, committeth adultery. If you put her away, you, you keep on committing. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away, committeth adultery. Now, it's just not the one thing of putting them away or divorcing it. It's not just the one-time act of remarriage in the divorce. It puts you in an ongoing position, a state of adultery, where it's perpetual as long as you're with that person. You say, but we ask God to forgive us. That's wonderful. But when we repent of our sin, we what? God. Every other sin in the, that we preach against, thievery, lying, murder, you know, fornication, we even believe that you quit fornicating when you get saved. The only one we make exception for in some movements is this matter of adultery. Adultery is one of the big ten. There are four ways you can commit adultery according to my Bible. The very act of adultery, this one night stands with someone that's not your wife. You can commit adultery by divorcing your wife and remarrying someone else. You can commit adultery by lust and fantasizing in your mind about having illicit intercourse with someone that's not your companion. And God said, Know ye not, ye adulterers and adulterers, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. It's called spiritual adultery or idolatry. There are four ways that people are going to be caught in Revelation 21.8. adulterers. And friend, the church has been very silent. But your King James Bible here in Luke 16 and Mark chapter 10 gives the clearest explanation of this situation. And listen, I believe in the innocent party. I was one. My mom and dad divorced when I was 12. I didn't have anything to do with it. But I was left with a split home. I was left to live with my mother and my dad separated. I was innocent. There's some innocent children that are torn apart by divorce and remarriage. And it's, it's, it's as prevalent in the church world as it is in the secular world. Because the pulpits do not preach that marriage is a lifelong agreement. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The two become one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man, judge, lawyer, put asunder because they become one flesh friend and nothing can separate that one flesh but death. So that's why death is the only reason, legitimate reason that an individual can remarry if they've had a companion. You know, we're, we, we say, well, we're not polygamous. I heard a Lutheran preacher speaking at a political rally, but he got, he got the preaching. If I could get him for a revival, he's the only Lutheran I ever considered as an evangelist. But that crowd that he was speaking to was very, very worldly. It was a political type of thing, quasi-spiritual, political. He got up and he said, We're, this generation is a bunch of polygamists, serial polygamists. Serial means you only have them one at a time. Wife, get rid of, wife, get rid of. He called them serial polygamists. I'd never heard that term before. But it stuck with me. And friend, we, I paid for a divorce before Jesus saved me. Had it not been for someone's prayers, had it not been for the grace and mercy of God, I could not be here this morning. Because my Bible tells me that a preacher must be the husband of one wife. 
I'm not here to hurt anyone. I'm not here to make anyone feel bad. But there's young people coming on in our churches, in our movement, that better have it settled in their heart that the choice that they make is a choice that God requires them to stay with till death do they part. I paid for the divorce. It was, it was one gavel from being slapped on the desk, one more meeting before the judge. He would slap the gavel down and said, go your way. God in his infinite mercy allowed us to get back together. We said, we're going to try it one more time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I've got my wife. I have two children, seven grandbabies. God allowed me to preach. I'd probably been in the devil's hell long before now. Oh, I'm so thankful for God's word this morning. Friend, God's word is clear. It's emphatic. And the old King James adds some light that these modern versions just don't add. There's some real benefit in studying into the old English. Let me, let me give you another tip. Your greatest friend in learning what the Bible teaches is a dictionary. We're too lazy to get the dictionary out and I find out what the word means. Isn't that sad? Friend, but if you don't know what the word means, you will never know what the verse means. Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. Write it down. Noah Webster's 1828 English Dictionary. He's 200 years closer to the, the language that the Bible was written in. So you're going to get a picture from some of these older words. You're going to get an idea of what they really meant, okay, and what the authors. You know, the, in, the, in Thessalonians, it says, We which are alive and remain shall not prevent them that are asleep. Prevent in our modern usage means to to stop from happening or to, um, you know, we're, we're just going to prevent forest fires. We're not going to allow forest fires. to take. Prevent means to kind of be a safeguard again. Pre means before. Vent means to go. We shall not go before them. You look it up in the Noah Webster's dictionary, it's very clear. The English language there is very clear. We shall not go before them which are asleep. For they shall the dead in Christ. He explains it in the next part. The dead in Christ who arise first. That means we're not going to go before them. But if you don't look up the words, if you don't try to study some of this, and it is well worth the effort. It is well worth the effort. You will find gold mines in your King James Bible if you'll just get a dictionary. Because Noah Webster wasn't only uh, a man of great academic ability, he was also a theologian. I've preached from his definition of redeemed. There's about five or six points in there about redemption. Wonderful. He has a spiritual understanding, and he also has the academic understanding of the English language. Noah Webster, it costs you $50 in the hardback. If you use uh, digital media, uh, esword.net, free Bible software, lots of things you can get, lots of tools you can get with it. But the thing that it has with it, it has Noah Webster's dictionary for free. So when you look up, if you're studying on your iPad or your notebook or your tablet or even your phone, you can look up the word. It's just real simple. And you can, you can do your Bible study. Uh, there's a digital format that's free. The paper copy, again, costs you about 50 bucks. But I recommend it heartily. Let me look at a few changes in the New King James just to get, you, uh, get us to where we need to be. Uh, the word sodomite is removed from the New King James Old Testament. It is replaced with the word pervert. Sodomite is specific to a certain sin. Pervert could be a number of different things. So there's a, there's a significant difference in those two words. They don't mean the same. Matthew 7, 14, the narrow way is changed to the difficult way. Now, do you, would you agree with that? Is this way difficult? Oh, it's got some hardships, but when I think about Jesus said the way is, is narrow, I think that it means that just, you know, there's not a lot of people going. Few there be that find it. He said that himself. But narrow doesn't necessarily mean difficult in my mind. I don't equate those two words. In Acts 3.13, the King James Bible has glorified his son. The new King James says he's glorified his servant. Is there a difference between a servant and a son? Is that the same thing? Not the same thing. 
Okay. And then in Matthew 22, speaking of Christ, the King James says that they worshipped him. In the New King James, they knelt down and asked him something. <laughs> any, any close translation there? And I mean, I've asked my wife a lot of things. I don't get down and kneel very often when I ask her. But that's not the same as worshiping. Not even close. First John 14, 16, and 26, the New Ch King James changes comforter to helper. I mixed mud for brick mason. I was his helper. I wasn't his comforter. <laughs> is there a difference in the words helper and comforter? There is. And it changes the meaning, folks. Some of it may seem slight, but it doesn't take much deviation to start us down the wrong path. We need the pure Word of God. We have the pure Word of God. We have the preserved Word of God in the King James Bible. I believe it with all my heart. John 14, 16, I done read that. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 changes the word. Now this, this one really gets me. In the King James it says, of those which are saved. In the New King James, those that are being saved. Is this a progressive work? Do we grow into grace? Is it gradually moving toward being a Christian? Or is it a crisis experience where we repent of our sins, exercise saving faith in Jesus Christ, and in a moment, a second of time, the Holy Spirit quickens us, gives us spiritual life, writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life, signs out and fills our adoption papers. We've heard good preaching on that already. But I want you to know, there's a big difference in being saved and becoming saved. Or, you know, when we, when we get saved, friend, it is God's work, and we've heard all the messages, but it's, it's very important that this translation be looked at very critically. I understand now, I didn't do the research on this myself, but I understand that there are far more changes in the New King James Bible than there is in the Jehovah Witness Bible. I've seen some numbers. It's, uh, in, it's over 1,000 changes in the New King James and only 400 and some in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Again, I didn't do that research. I'm relying on someone else to do that, but that's what I have been able to find. So it's not only the Scriptures that you need to be careful with. One other thing I want to give you before I, I dismiss and we have a short break before the memorial service. You need to be careful which study Bible you get. Footnotes, margin notes, commentaries, either in your Bible or in your shell. Beware of people that discredit the King James Bible. There are many Bibles out there, and many of them are for specific doctrinal persuasion. I would urge you never to buy a Schofield Bible unless you believe in unconditional, eternal security, which we do not believe in. I believe in eternal security, but when you add that word unconditional, you make it a false doctrine. There's nothing unconditional in the Word of God. You say, nothing? I believe nothing. When God wants you to be saved, there's two conditions. Repent and believe. Right? When God wants you to be sanctified, it's consecrate, confess out on the old man, and surrender. There's conditions. You want to go to heaven, you must be born again. There's conditions. All through the Bible, there's conditions. When, I, when someone tells me that I can make a verbal profession in Jesus... And that's all I need to do is say, I believe that Jesus is Lord. The devils believe that and tremble, my Bible says. But I am now clear to continue to live as I've always lived, but some magical covering or some red garment the Lord's looking through, he doesn't see me, he sees the blood. Friend, he sees you. And your free moral agency didn't stop when you got saved. And your responsibility to be obedient to God does not stop when you get saved. It starts. 
Amen. But there are many Bibles out there, many that have a specific doctrinal persuasion. Uh, I, I bought a Dakes annotated Bible, lots and lots of information in the Dakes Bible, but it is tainted very badly. It has tons of historical information, but it also has a very strong bent to Calvinism, okay? I'm trying to give you information that should help you if you, if you will search it out, beware of the footnotes, beware of the cross-references where they take you. I have been using the Thompson Chain Reference Bible now for about 43 years. I have faith in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible not that any man is perfect in his uh, lining up of scriptures necessarily, but I have found no major doctrinal problems with the chain references in the Thompson Chain Bible. And it's very helpful because it takes topics. And let me give you this little tidbit of information. I, everywhere I've pastored, I've told my people, uh, it's good to read through the Bible yearly, but when you get... On the January 1st in Genesis 1, and then July, you're over around uh, Jeremiah or Malachi or one of the minor prophets. Can you remember much about what you read in Genesis at that moment? Every Christian should read the Bible through as often as God wants you to. Read the whole thing. That way you don't miss anything. But every Christian who wants to be a student of the Word should begin a topical study. Sin, heaven, hell, redemption, atonement, whatever subject you want to study, but study it through the whole Bible. Study the subject I mentioned. Study it through the whole Bible, marriage. See what God has to say about it through the whole book. You'll come up with some very clear convictions of what God wants. When you study this topically, and uh, I'm a firm believer that every Christian needs to study the Bible Topically, as well as read it devotionally. Because to be a good student of the Word, you need to know what it says about the Sabbath from Genesis. You know, the Sabbath really began in Genesis. God instituted the, the Sabbath day in Genesis. Not in Exodus at Mount Sinai. He instituted the Sabbath in Genesis. And read through what He requires on the Sabbath. Thou shalt do no work. Over in, I think it's Jeremiah, it said, when you quit doing your own pleasure on my holy day. I mean, there's a lot of things about the Sabbath you just don't pick up in a casual reading. But if you study the Sabbath all the way through, you study uh, these different topics all the way through, you will have a complete overview of what the entire Bible has to say about it. And it doesn't disagree with itself. You know, there's people that says, well, I've got a verse that says this. You take the clearest verse in the Bible on any subject and then you bring every other verse into compliance with that. That's Bible exegesis. The clearest verse in the Bible on any subject should be the standard, should be that which forms our doctrine. And then if there's verses that seem to not say exactly the same thing or even seem to be contradictory, it's a matter of interpretation. It's not God's word is contradictory. We need the proper interpretation. And sometimes you have to look at a strong concordance. Sometimes you have to look at uh, a Greek lexicon. Sometimes you have to look at Robertson's word pictures. Sometimes you have to get some study tools and get down to the, to the very meaning of it. And then Noah Webster's on top of that. And then you come up, hey, that doesn't disagree with that verse. I've not found verses to disagree. The Bible does not contradict itself when properly interpreted. Well, thank you for coming this morning to Sunday School. We're going to have just about a 10-minute break now. I'm five minutes over what I wanted to do. We're going to have about a 10-minute break. If you need to go to the restroom, stretch your legs, and then at 10 o'clock we'll start the memorial service. Let's stand and dismiss with prayer.